in terms of the resume and, and, and scraping or automated tools that, that find the resumes, it's, it's, um, it's always best to have it in kind of like a word or PDF format that isn't, um, you know, you get, you can get these resume templates that are, you know, look, look really nice and some designer put it together and they're sort of boxes all over the place and, and things like that. That's very hard for, for the programs to, to read and pick up. Um, and basically when a recruiter finds your resume, they'll drag it into the CRM and then it auto populates into the CRM. Hello friends, my name is Kirill and you're listening to my UX career podcast. On this podcast, I'm sharing my personal thoughts on how to start a career path in UX, how to grow your skills and become a better designer. Also, I have conversations with other designers and design leaders trying to show that there are many different perspectives and opinions on the key questions about UX career. So if you're a UX designer or considering becoming one, this podcast will get you better prepared for finding a job in UX. Opinions expressed on this podcast are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of my current or previous employers. And don't forget, this is just one human's point of view. Also, if you're interested in UX career insights and um, some key learnings from my experience, uh, you can sign up for my newsletter about UX career. Uh, Go to newsletter.uxcareer.co. Now, back to the episode. Today, I'm talking to David Fitzgerald. Uh, He's a senior technical recruiter who helps tech companies find candidates as an external agency. We talk about his story of getting into the industry, how recruitment agencies work, the advantages and disadvantages of working with one, and why they are being vague with some opportunities. We also touch on the reasons why candidates are being ghosted, and some tips on optimizing your resume and LinkedIn profile, so automation systems do not ignore it. And obviously, a lot more insights from the life of a recruiter. Enjoy. Hey David, thanks for coming. Hi Carol, thank you. Thanks, thank you very much for having me. Uh, thanks, yeah, thanks for coming to the show. And I think your your perspective on the on this relationship between the candidates and recruiters would be super valuable for the audience to really understand the the other side of this coin because quite a few of the folks that I spoke with they had quite negative experience working with recruiters, Mm -hmm. mostly the common problems that I've heard about were the irrelevant jobs and ghosting and just kind of lack of transparency and communication Mm -hmm. and sometimes extended timelines. So there are many, I think, known issues, but I think there must be some reasons behind those. And I'm sure that you, as a person working in this industry, as an expert here, would be able to answer those questions and uh, hopefully provide some tips and share some advice with the with the designers who are trying to decide if they want to work with the recruiter or not and how they can make sure that this relationship is uh, more productive and effective for both sides. Well, let's start with just your introduction and what you currently do and what, what has been your experience in this industry. For sure. So um, basically in, in 2008, I, I, I joined the, the recruitment space. Or sorry, 2018, I should say. Um, as a, as a technical technical recruiter at a company called Talent Partners, um, and uh, since since then I, I did move on to a new uh, company called Matchbox um, after being there for about a couple of years, and just recently I um, have decided to take a, a new opportunity. So I was at Matchbox for almost two years, and and right now you've you've caught me on my week between, between jobs. So an interesting time. It's interesting to be on the candidate side of, of things recently. Um, I think that'll help with this discussion as well to, to maybe, to maybe empathize a bit more. Um, I definitely understand both, both uh, perspectives. That's for sure. Yeah. I think experiencing the other side's um, point of view, like, for, like hands-on, so to say, uh, would definitely give a different perspective and additional maybe even empathy, improve the empathy that you can feel uh, as a part, as a recruiter working from the other side now. 
what, what exactly do you do? Like, and maybe let's focus on the Matchbox uh, experience as the most recent one. As and as a typical, as I understand, like tech roles uh, recruitment agency uh, company. Uh, how does it really work? Like, what does a recruiter do at this company? For sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I Matchbox is an agency. There's a number of different models that re- recruiters work under. Um, of course, some are internal, so they work specifically with that company as, as one of their employees. Um, there's RPO, where you work with a firm that you basically get placed at a company at one at a time and focus, so it's similar to internal. Um, and then agency, which I was doing at Matchbox, which is you, you work with clients, um, multiple clients. So um, I would be working with you know any number of companies ranging from... Um, startup up to enterprise level uh, clients and, and finding talent for, for, for those companies. So um, it's, it's interesting in agency, you, you're working on a, on a vast majority of, of different projects, um, which I think is, is really interesting to sort of see what different types of companies are looking for and what, you know, the difference between the, the candidates that they choose to hire and, and, and choose not to. So um I think agency is a quite a quite a good sort of sort of perspective, I guess, in terms of broad broad knowledge of the, the industry. Yeah, I think it, it applies to the design profession as well. Working at an agency gives you a much broader depth, not depth, but variety of different projects and clients and uh, even industries that you can work with. So I, I think there are definitely some similarities there. Uh, I'm curious to understand really, like as an ex- because I spoke with a few recruiters as well, um, but I want to understand your uh, experience. At what point does a company engage with an agency like this? And at what point does the recruiter really start working with the candidates? Like how, how are you involved in the process of uh, sourcing and uh, interviewing and potentially handing off to the, to the company? For sure. Yeah. So, I mean, basically uh, companies can, uh, you know, some, something that might be a, a catalyst for them to be hiring is, of course, if maybe they get a funding round, um, they have a new project that comes on, uh, maybe they signed up a new client, whatever the case might be. Um, there's obviously a lot of different reasons why they, they would choose to be, to be hiring. Um, but to engage with an agency is, um, I'd say historically, usually the agency is the one reaching out to the company, trying to get their business. Um, and then, uh, of course, with market conditions, that changes. But more recently, it's actually been, I've experienced a lot of companies actually reaching out to the agencies, kind of um, desperate for help, basically, to, to, um, to help with that hiring process. Um, and typically, what would happen is, in the agency world, um, there's account managers within a company, and then there's the recruiters within the company. So the account managers are the ones who actually deal with the the client, so maybe that's the VP of engineering or CTO or hiring manager or whoever it might be within the company, um, and then they, you know, dig into the role, the the culture fit, the technical background, everything that you know is going to be the most successful um, candidate, and and then that information is uh, portrayed to the recruitment team, and then the recruitment team, you know, get to work in terms of reaching out to, to the right people. And, you know, uh, you know, typically recruiters will be, you know, speaking with these candidates fairly regularly. So they, they can, um, you know, the the idea is to get candidates to the company as, as quickly as possible, um, so that they provide, you know, the, the, the best value. Um, but all, all these things obviously are sort of, uh, based on variables in the market and how quickly things can happen and, and everything like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, could you share the story? Why did you decide to go this route and really join this recruitment world? Uh, yeah. What was maybe the motivation or maybe something that really uh, sparked the interest for you? For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting. I think there's, um, there's just like there's a stigma of, of candidates not uh, maybe having that positive experience with recruiters. I think there's um, there's a stigma in the in the business that recruitment isn't a very fun business to, to be in. There's that's a obviously just a you know a stereotype and and uh, depends on on the person. But it is a it is a challenging industry for sure. Um, and um, you know there's 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 a lot of uh, kind of roller coaster just like any sales type of job I suppose. 
but my path to to recruitment, um, I, I would say I have a very uh, interesting roadmap in terms of my career. Um, I I started, you know, back in in university in, in music school. I, I was a drummer and percussionist. I played with the Wind Symphony and played with some rock bands. Um, got some you know record contract offers, and that was kind of my world back then. And then I decided, you know, I need to get into, um, I guess, quote unquote, a real job. So I, I, I went to business school to, to do marketing, the idea to get into real estate. Um, and I, 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 I became a commercial real estate broker. Um, and was, I did that for about five years, uh, in my early twenties and, you know, selling apartment buildings. It, it was quite a interesting world to be in, in your early twenties. I think a lot of the people that I worked with at the time, um, you know, were much older than me. Um, it was, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lucrative business. Um, but it, I was kind of burning myself out. And to be honest, I really missed the music world. So I have this yin and yang, I'd say between business and creative, um, which I think, um, helps me sort of get along with a lot of different people from different perspectives. Um, so basically I, I quit my real estate job and went back to school for music production, which, you know, I felt like I was a crazy person at the time. And I'm sure a lot of other people thought I was crazy as well. Um, going into sort of that profession from, from where I was and things like that, but I, I had to do it. It was, you know, one of these things where if I don't do it, I'll, I'll regret it. So I, I went to, um, uh, a music school in Vancouver called Nimbus, um, graduated from there. The owners of the school, there were Bob Edzer and he produced like Pink Floyd, um, Alice Cooper, you know, basically you name it, Bob Seeger. Um, he, he did that. Garth Richardson is the other owner. He produced Red Hot Chili Peppers, Rage Against the Machine, things like that. But basically I, um, I ended up working in the studio with them a, a bit. So I had these cool opportunities in, in the music world ended up moving to Australia with my girlfriend, now wife, um, and sort of took that whole music experience that I was really craving. But when I got back to Vancouver, um, as we all know, Vancouver is, is very expensive. And I kind of had this another moment where I got my fix of music, but I needed to get back into the business world or some a job that was more um, sort of aligned for, you know, that, that stage in my life. And... Um, a friend of mine um, had started a recruitment business. I didn't want to get back into real estate because I, I just thought I just had kind of left that world. I didn't want to go back to it. Um, and, and recruitment seemed like a really good option. Um, and at the time I didn't know anything about, you know, programming or coding languages. That was, that was very new to me. And I think that'll be a good part of our discussion is, you know, when people are new to the recruitment industry, how that, there's a huge learning curve there on, on the technical side of things. But, but to answer your question, I know this is sort of a long winded um, answer, but I think it's important to, to understand the twists and turns in terms of how I landed in, in recruitment. But um, one of the things that I, I like about recruitment is you are helping people um, who, need, who need the help and who appreciate the help rather than in real estate. I think my focus was more towards making rich people richer and for me, that's that's not very fulfilling. I think, um, although recruitment can a lot of people can see it as a as quite a challenging industry, um, it's also, you know, it, it it can provide a lot of you know fulfillment in terms of helping people achieve great things in their careers. Interesting, yeah, and uh, I'm sure there are lots of challenges that you face uh, as a part of your job, being in between, I guess, two sides of this marketplace, and like depending on each side um, all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we'll touch on those uh, interesting challenges uh, later um, in, in one of the next questions. Uh, let's start on the, I guess, the Pressing most questions about how UX particular candidates would, uh, should work and should consider working with um, recruiters or should not. So, and I'm sure that there are different people with different expectations and needs. And mm -hmm. I'm sure that re working with a recruiter, um, and we're talking about external recruitment, uh, like agencies model, 
uh, for candidates, it's not for everyone. I'm sure that there are some pros and cons to both sides. And some people I've talked to, they loved it and they were happy with the experience and the results. And some people were actually not, not big fans of that approach. Um, so I'm sure there are different people with different um, preferences. So what? let's start with like a bit more tactical questions about the resume portfolios and like all those first stage of the relationship and uh, what are you looking for in those? And maybe you can give some tips and advice and share some uh, mistakes that you've seen people do that do not help them find this job or start this search more effectively. For sure, yeah. I mean, in terms of um, pros with working with external agencies, um, uh like we were saying before, there's internal, which is someone who works at the company and as opposed to an agency recruiter who works with lots of different opportunities. So naturally there is, you're, you're, you are exposing yourself to more opportunities. Um, and also, you know, agency recruiters do have the perspective where, you know, they, they, if you win that they win. So they're very much on your side when it comes to ne- negotiating um, whereas if you're talking to an internal rec- recruiter, um, you know, not saying one is better than the other necessarily, but um, they're going to have um, kind of more vested interest in, in the company that they're, they're hiring for rather than for the candidate because they're not getting paid sort of on commission. So oh, they don't you mean have... like the, 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 the pricing model, like the commission model that the recruiters yeah. used? Oh. Yeah. So it, it does kind of incentivize an agency recruiter to kind of have your, your, your best interests in, in, in mind, I would say. Um, and you're exposed to, you know, multiple jobs and, and also as new jobs come up with, with new companies, you're, you're going to be exposed to those as well, because these, these agency recruiters are going to have you in mind. If, if you guys have had a discussion or have, have some sort of a relationship. Um, so sometimes that the interesting part about that is, you know, maybe you're not looking for a job, um, but you've spoken with an agent, agent uh, or a recruiter from an agency, I should say, maybe a year prior or something like that, and a job comes up, um, and that recruiter might come forward to you to to give you that opportunity. Um, and unless you were looking yourself on on job boards or something like that, you you might not have known. Um, and and this is where some of these different perspectives come into play because some people really don't appreciate getting reached out to if they're not looking for a job. Um, but some people, you know, some people do, and some people, uh, even those that weren't looking and maybe at first kind of maybe had a thought, why are you reaching out to me? I I wasn't looking for a job. It maybe, maybe it ends up being an incredible opportunity that they, you know, after thinking about it over the weekend or something like that, they, they go forward and it's, you know, a, a big change in a positive direction. Um, and I think that kind of almost speaks you know, with my personal experience, like uh, recently, the the job that I've I've taken, I I wasn't looking, um, but you know, sometimes these things click into place, and there's a that's where sort of the agency recruiters I think can bring a lot of, of benefit. But um, like anything, there's 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 pros and cons for sure, and different perspectives, um, whether people want to hear from from those recruiters or not. Um, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, kind of, to, I don't want to kind of ask directly about the the negatives, but let's let's frame it this way. So, mm-hmm. who, what kind of candidate, or what kind of maybe role or position would not be great for for this uh, setup for the kind of for working with external recruiters? Who would who would benefit the most, and who would not benefit the most or the least? Yeah, it's. Uh... I guess the, the people that wouldn't benefit the most, um, I would say are more so on the senior side that are very well networked. Um, they, and I really don't think anybody is, isn't, is, or isn't going to benefit from a recruitment agency. It really just comes down to kind of the spe- specific circumstances. Um, I, I definitely think that there are issues within the, the recruitment industry that, you know, candidates, designers, or engineers, or whatever the case might be, have to have to kind of sift through that 
that uh, that murkiness, I guess, uh, in the sense that you know, not every agency recruiter is a great recruiter, um, and but there are incredible recruiters as well. But it's very hard, I think, for someone who's getting reached out to by a recruiter to know until you're quite deep into the relationship, whether that's the right person you should be talking to. Um, there's a lot of young people in the industry um, on, on the recruitment side that, uh, you know, maybe they, you know, they're, they're, they're only getting up to speed in, in their career as well. Um, but they're working on a, on a role that you'd be good for. Um, but there's other people that are, have been in the industry maybe for a while or have gotten up to speed really quickly that, that will serve you much better. And there's a huge, basically it really comes down to, I think the, uh, the specific recruiter rather than the recruitment mm. model. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously to, to find those and get those good relationships, you kind of have to talk to the bad ones too. You have to kind of um, experience a few different um, recruiters to know, you know, I, I enjoyed working with this one or, or not. And one of the, one of the biggest challenges is recruitment happens so fast and there's, it's, it's, uh, you might work on one job with, with someone, but then that, that person doesn't have a role that would be a good fit for a few months or something like that. So by that time you've been hired by another company or whatever the case might be, and then you're working at that company for a couple of years and it's, there's, there's gaps, I guess, between the, where, when you're looking for a job and, and when you aren't. So it's hard to sort of um, know for sure. I really sympathize with the the engineers and designers and, and candidates um, because it's uh, it, it can be really a gamble in terms of, you know, who you should and shouldn't talk to. And I know that, um, for example, you know, a, a lot of in the industry right now, so many companies are hiring that you might get a call from 10 recruiters in a day. And how are you supposed to know, like, am I supposed to talk to all of them? Um, there, there's really no way. And a lot of the time also the recruiters, um, you know, they, they can't share, especially on the agency side, they can't share all the information, like the company name and, you know, everything else that you might want to hear about the company in, in a first sort of email to you, because then there's a risk that you just go and apply directly. Um, so they're trying to sort of protect themselves as well. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in. I, I'm, I'm glad we're digging in deeper to it. I hope I'm answering your, your, your question. Already. Yeah. It's a, to, it's a difficult one to answer. To be yeah. And to be fair, there was like several questions bunched into one, like just, uh, kind of spit out there. Uh, I've heard also that some recruiters and some agencies, uh, recruitment agencies, occasionally work with companies who do not advertise their jobs. Can you share any insight into this? Like, is it like a secret hidden job market of sorts that uh, you may have access to, but uh, that's not posted on the job boards? Yeah. So, I mean, most of the time companies will advertise as well. Um, But I think, you know, some companies really rely heavily on the agencies. It is a, a huge time investment to manage the recruitment process. Um, and, you know, if, if, if maybe if a, if a company posts the jobs, then, you know, they're required or they're, they're sort of expected to reply to the people that, that apply to the job. Um, so it, in that case, to be honest, it's, it's probably more of a, a situation where the company is relying on the recruitment uh, company to, to do that work for them to make sure that the, 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 the candidates that they end up speaking to are, are ones that are already vetted and the ones that, you know, aren't a fit for the role, um, you know, they're not responsible for, for that rejection process, um, which, you know, can be time consuming and, and also, you know, can have a a few headaches. Obviously some people don't like being rejected for a role. So, um, you know, I think they're, to be honest, I think they're, the companies are more so avoiding that sort of situation and, and, and looking for just a more quality stream that has already been vetted by, uh, by a human rather than just a sort of a computer program or whatever the case might be. Mm -hmm. And the, I'm curious to, maybe you can answer those, uh, those 
more like smaller questions uh, that mm -hmm. relate to some of the patterns that I've seen experience myself when the recruiters maybe ghosting candidates, and I've yeah. heard this from many friends and uh, colleagues, is just kind of one of the frustration points is ghosting candidates. And this doesn't necessarily limit it. It's not limited to the external recruiters. So companies are, are kind of guilty as well. So maybe you, from that side of the question, can elaborate and really unveil the reason why this is happening and what candidates maybe can do or what should they do to maybe to not be ghosted. Yeah, absolutely. That this is this is a big one. This is definitely a, a big one in terms of um, people's experiences and uh, sort of a negative experience around the process. Um, so I guess from obviously I'm I'm on the recruitment side, so I can kind of shed some light maybe behind the curtain that that people aren't able to see when they're not in a recruitment company. Um, and I definitely think everyone should get some sort of you know. Um, feedback or uh, a message closure. about closure. Yeah, closure. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I'm not. I definitely don't want to say that I I'm okay with ghosting. That's definitely it's not, um, and it's a huge problem in the industry. Um, I think for agencies, they're obviously not part of the company, and unfortunately, recruiters actually experience this ghosting thing as well. <laughs> <laughs> so. And sometimes, um, and this isn't always the case uh, for to, to blanket over this entire issue, but sometimes even, even us as recruiters won't get feedback. Sometimes it's just, um, no, you know, we, we've, we've decided this isn't going to be the right fit. Um, and I know that with, with myself and through my, my, my time at Matchbox, we, we would always dig in and, and do our best to, to get more feedback. But the reality is that there are situations for sure where even the recruiters don't get the feedback and that's not to justify that they don't pass that information along to the, to the candidate to, 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 to give that closure. At least um, I, I guess I'm assuming when we speak about ghosting there, they might not even kind of be told that they yeah, it's just are like rejected or silence, not. Silence yeah. for weeks. And then they show up a month or two later with a message that, automated message that they're not uh, going forward, which is, yeah, quite uh, disrespectful uh, from sure. my point of view. Yeah, no, absolutely. And um, I think, and again, this speaks to a lot of the challenges in, in the recruitment space itself is that there's a lot of pressure on recruiters, um, especially at certain companies to, to constantly be performing. And the numbers that are really you know, that are calculated aren't how many rejection messages did you send today there? It's how many new candidates have you brought in? Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate to to have, you know, not worked at a company um, uh, through my time at, at Matchbox where there's, um, you know, huge pressure to, to only focus on bringing candidates in. It's, it's all about the relationship long term. Um, but there are absolutely firms where you, you're you're kind of wrapped up in a in a micromanaged situation where you know don't worry about the rejection we we need more candidates now because otherwise the other recruitment firm is going to fill this role um, and also I think especially younger recruiters um, who are new to the business and maybe aren't used to that sort of rejection um, part of the business. You know, they, 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 they carry, you know, a certain level of guilt and maybe uh, embarrassment. It's, it's, it's difficult to tell someone that they didn't get, to, to, didn't get the job, especially when you don't have, you know, solid feedback on, on why. Exactly. And, and sometimes, um, sometimes you do get the reason why, and it's hard to tell people the, the reason why, because maybe they were rude, um, but you don't want to tell them that they were rude. Um, or something, something along those lines. If so, it's yeah, it's. Um, I definitely don't agree that candidates are ghosted, um, but I think um, I think most of the time, or at least a lot of the time, it's it's not a malicious decision. It's sometimes stress induced. Sometimes people are um, 
um, basically trying to keep their, their superiors happy, but, uh, or, or internal struggles or whatever the case might be. But at the end of the day, it's, it's definitely not justified, um, in terms of that relationship and causes more, a lot of harm. I think that the stigma in the market against agency recruiters comes from these, you know, little things that can be easily, easily fixed. Exactly. And I think that just uh, sheds a bad light on the whole industry and just yeah, adds to the stigma of working with recruiters. Uh, yeah. Even though it could be just a few spoiled uh, apples uh, in a bunch, right? So it's, it's definitely hard for, more responsible recruiters to to manage this damage and to mitigate this um yeah so it's almost like you're a hostage to the situation as a part of this bigger group of people who are not all the same and may not have the same ethics uh, and may not have the same uh yeah guilt tolerance of sorts for sure and one thing i guess i would add to that also is um you know for in terms of advice for people who who want the feedback and who are mm-hmm. getting ghosted it's, it's, it's always great to follow up with, with the recruiter. Um, I think some, sometimes people don't follow up at all um, and kind of uh, sort of, it, it, it just, the, the, the problem kind of compounds because the recruiter's not thinking about it um, and, and the candidate is waiting uh, and it kind of just causes more and more frustration. I think it's, it's, it's great to send, um, uh, even just a quick note to say, hey, I'm, I'm just following up about this. And and if you keep doing it, it's pretty hard for the recruiter to to not realize, you know, I, I, I should probably get back to this person. Like I'm not making myself look too good. And um, not to say that the onus is on the candidate, but I do think that sometimes um, uh, candidates would rather wait for the feedback rather than kind of push for it. And and you should make you should get that recruiter to to you know do the work that they're supposed to be doing. Don't don't be scared to give the recruiter a hard time. Mm-hmm. Following up is also quite a tricky uh, activity because uh, it could be too much following up. It could be could could feel like almost like a spam or just too needy, right? So, would you have any recommendation? What's the right um, maybe timeline or frequency or number of those follow-up uh, contacts? For sure, yeah. I mean, for me personally, I, I like to have a conversation with candidates before and after pretty much every interview process, step of the interview process. Um, and if that was the case, if I was talking to, um, let's say I had a, a final interview with, with a company, I would probably want to send if I was in the candidate shoe and I hadn't spoken to them on the phone after or something like that. I would want to send them a you know a friendly email just saying how the interview went, um, that you're excited about moving forward with the process or whatever the case might be, and um, ask them you know do, is is there a, an expected timeline for for feedback or, or do you know um, and. You know, in terms of timeline after that, I'd, I'd say following up on the on the Friday before the weekend. And if you don't hear on Monday, follow up again on, on Monday. Um, and I'd say if if if, if you're if you're spamming or I, I don't really think I don't really think you're you're, you're spamming at all. If you're not getting a re- reply, um, then, uh, you know, leaving a few days maybe in between follow-ups is, 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 is a good idea. Um, but I don't think you should feel like you're spamming a recruiter. Um, I know that recruiters do have a very busy schedule. Um, and, uh, and that can be, be part of it, but, uh, you know, it, it shouldn't take a week to, to reply to, a to an email asking for some follow-up, even just to say, um, we're, we're waiting on feedback, anything in terms of a, a response. So, um, I, I don't think, um, I don't think there should be a, a factor of guilt there. Recruiters are, uh, are, are known for, you know, constantly messaging people. So it's okay to, uh, to give them kind of a taste of their own medicine, if you will. <laughs> um, actually on that note, um, I'm curious how many candidates, uh, 
at the same time you would you would work with like I'm just kind of trying to understand like the multitasking uh, aspect of your job and how many jobs do you have to juggle and candidates uh, maybe on like on average or maybe from what you've seen um, other recruiters uh, have on their plate because I assume if it's hundreds of candidates and you have to communicate and status updates and like all the check-ins with those hundreds um, it may get e- it may become easy to for you to to lose track of some of the communications and uh, this could be one of the reasons why um, recruiters may be just too overloaded with their with the numbers and um, th- this could potentially explain the the miscommunications and ghosting um, uh, symptoms definitely I um... So for me, m- most recently, right now specifically, is is the hottest that I've seen the market in a very long time. Um, I think um, every company is 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 growing. It seems like right now. Um, obviously, we've we've all seen a lot of the funding rounds that are happening for a lot of the companies. So there's a real battle battle for talent. Um, so recruitment firms, I'd say now more than ever, are extremely busy. I was working on. Um, you know, 20 plus roles at a time, um, most recently. And, uh, that's with multiple clients. So of course you have multiple clients who are, you know, messaging you quite regularly asking for updates, um, while you're also trying to juggle, uh, you know, working on, on multiple roles. And it's, 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 uh, in, in, in the market where it's so competitive for, for talent, of course, it's hard to find those, those candidates and, and have them take your, your job at the end of the day. So there's a huge amount of pressure on, on recruiters for sure, especially right now. Um, and it's, it's a huge facet in terms of the struggle of, of getting back, but there are different models, I would say with, um, with companies, like there's some, uh, agencies that have recruiters that focus very specifically on, you know, one thing, whether it's, you know, DevOps or software engineering or design or whatever the case might be. And, and they get assigned maybe five roles at a time, but they're expected to deliver on those roles within a very short period of time to, to get on another cycle of, of roles. So, you know, if I, if from, from, from my work, if, if I'm working on 20 roles, ideally you have, you know, three to five candidates for, for each of those, um, roles going through the process. So, um, you know, anywhere from 60 to hundred people at a time that you're trying to, 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 to juggle and get feedback for, and get, you know, rejection messages to, if they're, if, if they're, they don't make it through the process. Um, it's, it's definitely very time consuming. Um, so if someone's not really invested in, in the job, you know, if five o'clock means that they're, 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 they're off and, and outside of work starts, um, you know, you can, you can quickly see how that the, the, there's only so much, so many things you can, you can do in a, in a day, Mm -hmm. um, without sort of extending your, your, your hours, I, I guess you could say. Talking about the automation, I'm curious if you can share any insights on the applicant tracking systems or like the different automation uh, automated solutions that maybe recruiters use to that can actually make it harder for good candidates to get seen or something that they can maybe adjust to maybe even like the format of the resume like i've heard that some uh, systems just cannot read um, visually rich uh, resume formats uh, that some creatives prefer. So any insights on that? Like how can the really candidates minimize the risk of, I guess, being missed out by the tools and automations? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, the, I think it's, it's um, for me, I've, you know, I'm a, I'm a human. So when I look at a LinkedIn profile, I can, I can look at it and, with my experience know that okay you worked at this company uh so i know that you worked on this project because i have talked to other people who have worked at the company and things like that whereas obviously it's uh, automated or scanning sort of tool they're looking for keywords they won't know necessarily these sort of little nuances um so basically to to kind of optimize 
I think a candidate's chances of, of being seen and, and having uh, access to the, the best roles for them um, is it's so important to uh, to sort of structure your, your LinkedIn and resume in a way where you're, you're, you're listing all the technologies and tools and things like this that you have experience with um, and, and using the right um, a couple bullet points for each job that sort of specifically says, you know, maybe you're working on a SaaS product um, uh, to include the, 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 that it's a SaaS product. A lot of people will work on a SaaS project, for example, but it won't say in their LinkedIn uh, SaaS, like software as a service. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a hugely powerful thing to, to add these, these little things that you might think be, might be silly because you know that your colleague doesn't need to be told that it's a SaaS uh, mm-hmm. product, but the junior recruiter or the automation tool or whatever the case might be, that's working on a, a great role that you'd be good for. Doesn't maybe, maybe know that, um, in terms of the resume and, and, and scraping or automated tools that, that find the resumes, it's, it's, um, it's always best to have it in kind of like a word or PDF format that isn't, um, you know, you get, you can get these resume templates that are you know, look, look really nice and some designer put it together and they're sort of boxes all over the place and, and things like that. Um, that's, that's very hard for, for the programs to, to read and pick up. Um, and basically when a recruiter finds your resume, they'll drag it into the CRM and then it auto populates into the CRM. Um, but if it's in one of those strange templates, the, the program can't read it and, Unfortunately, you you get lost within the the database. Um, so of course, people will still find you, but your chances are are, are much are much lower. Um, and there's also I think one thing that I've noticed in in resumes, uh, not so much maybe for the scanning purposes, but using certain verbs and um, and uh, kind of better English, it it goes a long way when, when, when uh, recruiters are looking, because after you've looked at thousands of resumes and you realize that those are the people that end up getting hired over and over again, um, you know, it's one of many things like having the right personality in terms of no ego and things like that all mixed in, but um, using the right verbs. And there's actually a really useful tool, which I think um, this is kind of a a good time to, to sort of bring that up. But Harvard um, has amazing resources online and I'll send you the the link if you if you want to uh, share it with um, yeah your, yeah your this audience. would be great I will include this in the show notes but basically they have a, a list of um, action verbs that they recommend using in resumes as, along with uh, multiple resume templates that um, that are you know I, I highly recommend that as a, as a resource that's a very good tip yeah and I've heard about like the the proper grammar and all this uh, I guess what sounds like a very simple and like very basic thing to do, but lots of lots of candidates miss miss that. And even like simple spell checker would would help uh, so many people. But I think this tool that you're referring, I would love to see it myself. I don't think I've I've used it. Uh, yeah. So I'll include this in the notes um, when you send me uh, after the recording. Okay. So one more question I had for you, and maybe this will be super quick, but. Um, can you explain how the compensation model works for recruiters? Like, I just want to, uh, because I've heard this question from many folks, and there are some, I guess, not debate, but uncertainty about the percentage or the range of percentages, or even like, how does it even, how is it even structured? For sure, yeah. I mean, there's there's a huge um, variety, I would say, within the, in the industry about how the recruiter themselves get paid, but in terms of the agency um, getting paid itself, um, basically it's it's typically between twenty to twenty five percent um, for the first year salary that the the recruitment agency makes. Um, so, you know, obviously if there's a hundred thousand dollar salary roll, they're going to be making. Twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars on on that placement. Um, 
And then in terms of the recruitment team and and things like that, again, the structure is always different at at different companies, but um, typically within agencies, either it's on a hundred percent commission model where um, the recruiters don't make money unless they make placements. And in in that case, the commission is, is, um, is quite a bit higher for them, um, but they need to be consistently placing, placing, um, uh, placing people in roles um, or what I'd say is more typical is that a recruiter will be on some sort of a base salary. Um, n- you know, nothing crazy, something to, to basically uh, p- pay the bills in, in Vancouver um, and, uh, and then make a, a commission for every role that they place on top of that, um, which is, you know, typically uh, obviously less than if, if they weren't making any sort of salary at all. Um, so it, it, I mean, it, it varies a lot. <clears throat> and I think from the candidate's perspective, obviously you hear the, these numbers of, wow, this person just placed me, he, that, that person just made $25,000 and, you know, they had two, two phone calls with me and, and they, they didn't give me any advice and, you know, all these types of things, which, you know, this, it's, 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 uh, it's really, sort of um, interesting to, to, to see because I absolutely sympathize with a lot of those types of perspectives. Um, but I think like we talked about before, you know, um, first of all, that recruiter is not making $25,000. Um, usually it's going to be a lot less than that, like quite a bit less than that. Obviously the recruitment firm takes, takes most of it. Um, especially if they're on a, on a, on a, on a salary uh, component of their compensation as well. Um, so, you know, the, the recruiter that is placing you in a, in a $100,000 salary role, is, there's, there's a good chance that person is making, you know, annually quite a bit less than, than that person getting, getting the job that's upset with them for making 25,000 that, that they're not actually getting. Um, so it's there's a there's just so many um, misunderstandings in the recruitment space for for sure that um, um, and different levels of service. I think the the main thing I'd, I'd say with our conversation here that that uh, I think we both really agree on is that there's a huge amount of confusion in the market, and the, there's a huge amount of need for improvement. Everything from the tools that we use to the communication from both sides. Um, I think obviously the onus is a bit more on the recruiters to, to, to provide that level of communication, um, but also empathy from the candidate's side in, in certain situations. Um, but I, I think in, in five years, I'm going to be really interested to see what the, the recruitment space looks like, what sort of technologies are available, um, what's, how much is automated, how people are found, but I think in, for candidates themselves, the best way that they can succeed in these, this next five years forward is, is simple things like formatting your, your resume in the right way, including all the right technologies and tools that you've, you've worked with. And then in a personal level, when you actually get this chance to speak with these companies and network with people in the industry to, to have a, a mindset of hunger for growth and eagerness to learn lack of ego. Uh, I, I can't tell you how many times someone amazing at their job hasn't got the job because they, they come across the wrong way in, a, in an interview process. Um, it's, uh, there's, there's lots of work to be done. And um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited uh, for, for, the, for the future, but uh, we'll, we'll see what the next five, five or so years look like. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, the future is definitely uh the thoughts about the future are intriguing especially with how COVID has changed anything to even like remote uh appeal and remote preferences and all these different logistical challenges and uh, additional processes and technologies that have to be invented and adopted much faster so it's definitely interesting uh, interesting few years that, that's coming I, I agree with that uh talking about Empathy. I think a lot of a lot of people would benefit from more empathy towards each other, and this is not just even like this particular conversation, but overall. 
So, and I agree that there are many misconceptions about the role of recruiters. And I think if you can share maybe like the biggest pain points from your point of view as a recruiter, maybe candidates would be more uh, understanding and more empathetic and uh, yeah, maybe more kind as well and uh, more open to the idea of working with with recruiters uh, comparing to all the current uh, beliefs and stereotypes um, that are circulating in the industry. So what's really the hardest part of being as, as a recruiter? That's a, that's a, it's, it's a hard one to answer for sure. Maybe, maybe that's the hardest part about being a recruiter, being able to say the one thing that's the hardest. Maybe about, a couple. You know, yeah. Just gonna, <laughs> maybe what, what yeah. are the top things? Because I'm sure there are sure. dozens of problems. Like what are the, the most, the biggest pains? For sure. Yeah. I mean, I think for, for people earlier in their career, one of the biggest pain points and probably uh, points of stress for them is I remember when I started recruiting and I didn't know, you know, I didn't know what Kubernetes was. I didn't know what Golang was. I didn't know what all these um, terms were. And it took me time to, to, to understand what, you know, what it was going on in, in, in the technology side. I still have lots to learn. Um, I think everybody's, you know, constantly learning and, and, and improving, but um, a huge pain point is the, the education piece. There's a lot of people who, you know, the barrier to entry to be a recruiter is extremely low. Um, it's not like a realtor where you at least have to write an exam um, to to gain some level of knowledge before you, you get into the business. Uh, for a recruiter, you know, oftentimes people come from being a server at a restaurant or something like that because they're good at talking to people. And, and, and so you're, you should be a that, good recruiter. That's a requirement for the entry level. <laughs> Just not, I mean, <laughs> I mean, of course, that's that's not um, ideal, but um, everybody's got to start somewhere, and um, and people who come from that background, you know, it, it's it's not an indicator of if they're going to do well or, or not. Oftentimes, they do really well um, because it is important to be able to get, be good at talking and 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 communicating with different people, but. Um, I think one of the big point pain points is definitely the learning curve, um, uh, and also, um, you know, you're basically constantly starting from 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 scratch in a in a way when you're a recruiter, because um, not everyone is always looking for for a new role. You're always looking for the right person at the right time. Um, you know, a certain role and a certain candidate might not match up when when you when you hope that they do. Um, so you're kind of, you, you're constantly on your toes, you know, every, it is a sales job at the end of every month, a new month starts and you're kind of back to zero in terms of your numbers. So I think for a lot of recruiters, the big, a huge pain point is just kind of the marathon of, of work that you, you, you do. And it's the same with, you know, pretty much any job. Um, you know, I know a lot of software engineers that have, 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 incredibly stressful schedules and everything like that and and it's no different for for the recruitment so it's important to to um to not get burnt out basically and recruitment is a space that you can quite easily get get burnt out um and another kind of pain point i think is this is this kind of stigma that we're we're trying to uh um deconstruct and the stigma is there for good reason um, but for, for recruiters, it's, uh, it, it can be, it can be challenging when you're, maybe you're a good recruiter, maybe you've got a great role and you found a candidate who would be great for the, the role and you give them a, a call or an email or whatever the case might be. And because that person has had a negative experience with someone else in the past, they, they don't want to talk to you. Um, even though everybody could win in the situation, and and that can be frustrating. But yeah, it's like in dating or relationships, right? So it's kind of yeah. all the previous scars they they kind of uh, remind you of the previous experiences, and um, you're already kind of cautious, and uh, potentially have uh, some bias against the next person, which is completely, in most cases, irrelevant and should not be there. But that's humans. <laughs> yeah. No. I, there's. I kind of see relative relativity in in everything, and absolutely, dating is 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 pretty much like being a, a, a recruiter. 
uh, you're kind of speed dating in a way. Awesome. Okay. So maybe one more question and we'll wrap up. Um, I'm curious. So thinking about, again, this relationship, right, between the candidate and the recruiter. Can you describe, and again, this is just your personal opinion and uh, from your experience and what you what you already learned while working in this industry. Can you describe the perfect a perfect candidate for you? That's an interesting question for sure. Um, <laughs> um, the perfect. Who, who am I looking for? Yes. <laughs> I guess it. I mean, it, of course, depends on the the role, but I mean, in general terms, um, like um, one of the the most important things that I've seen, and I always, basically, when I experience this, it's like, okay, I got this guy's back or girl's back, sorry, whichever the case might be. Um, and, um, and it basically is, is their, their personality, their empathy and their attitude to, towards, um, you know, thing, things in general, basically like there, I have a lot of calls with people who are um, probably amazing at their job, um, but they have a, a very strong ego. They're very opinionated. And, and in some cases that's, that's really important. Like you, you need to be able to step into a role and have your opinion and, and provide the, um, you know, the ability to, 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 to execute whatever you, you need to do. But time and time again, I think the, if I was going to say the, the, the kind of secret sauce to a perfect candidate is, you know, of course, all the boxes are, are checked in terms of, um, um, you know, the experiences that they've had, they, they've got some decent experience under their belt, um, you know, uh, education or whatever the case might be. But the thing that really sets people apart is, and I think motivates recruiters or myself, I know for sure, is that if, if I get along well with the person and they, they're, they're eager to, to, to work with me, um, and I'm not saying that they need to be thanking me every second or anything crazy like that, but um you know, for, for me, I, I like to provide a, a very high level of service to, to candidates. I like to talk to them before the call. Um, so I make sure that they've spoken to someone that day, aside from the person that's interviewing them. And, you know, they've got good questions lined up. They've got good things prepared for questions that they might be asked. Um, and then I like to talk to candidates after their interview as well to, to get a, um, a follow up. And, th- and that helps me um, of course, gauge their, their interest and, and, um, and make sure that any of their questions are answered. But really what that shows is the, the, the motivation and, and empathy and understanding from the candidate to me that we're working on this together and, and, you know, you, they appreciate what I'm doing and I appreciate what they're, that what they're doing. Um, sometimes people, you'll call them after an interview or, or before, and, and the answer that you get is kind of like, why, why are you calling me right now? Like, I, I, I don't need your help. Like, uh, you, you, you've introduced me to the company and now, now I'll, I'll take it from here kind of thing. And I, I, I think so maybe, maybe that's justified sometimes from people's past experiences again, but, um, you know, for me to, for me to help a candidate and from my experience of, of getting a successful result for a candidate, it, it's much easier for everyone um, if there's that, you know, two-way communication, and I think just lack of e- lack of ego is is so important. Yeah, so it sounds like the the transactional approach, when it's like you, me, and I am kind of the lead, is not the best way to approach, to to do this. It's more about the building a relationship and more equal partnership in this uh, engagement. I think so. Yeah, and. It's uh, the, I guess the other sort of kind of back to a bit of a, a pain point, I guess, is or unfortunate circumstances that, you know, when you do get a successful result and you do place a candidate, um, that person is going to be at that company for, let's say, two, two years plus or whatever the case might be. So you don't really get an opportunity to work with that person because you're not you're not going to go and poach from your own client. So the, the I think the relationship kind of almost unfortunately ends there in a way, which the candidates from the candidates perspective, it might be like, wow, I had a really good time working with David, but why isn't he calling me anymore? Like what, what happened? He doesn't care about me anymore. But 
but actually I'm just like, well, I, I can't take you away from my clients. So um, it's uh, that's, that's a really interesting part of agency, I would say. Um, yeah. Maybe a good friendly occasional check-in just kind of about, uh, I know something not directly related to, sure. are you interested in this job I have? Yeah, uh, no, maybe for sure. a good kind of, uh, yeah tactic um, to go with to keep this connection like this connection alive yeah i i agree with that for sure i think it to a certain degree it does loop back into that how busy the schedule is for yeah for, yeah. for the recruiter again it's all but, about priorities right yeah, yeah you have to deal it, with these kind of 20 roles right now and like 100 people like asap and yeah. then like all those kind of occasional check-ins that can be done tomorrow can be always rescheduled to the next day <laughs> yeah i've seen that Awesome. So this was super insightful. Uh, if somebody wants to to check in with you and uh, maybe talk more or just connect uh, for maybe future opportunities, uh, where should they look for you? Where can they find you? Yeah. So I mean, I'm um, basically on on LinkedIn, David Fitzgerald. Uh, most recently working at Matchbox. I'll be I'll be announcing my my next role next week, um, and then on Twitter, uh, I'm at David Fitz. F I T Z tech um, at David Fitz tech uh, on Twitter. Um, but uh, yeah, LinkedIn's LinkedIn is, uh, is, a, is definitely a, a great way to connect. And I'd, uh, I'd love to hear from, from anyone who'd like to reach out and connect. Mm -hmm. And I'll include the links in the, in the notes as well. Well, that's a, that's it for today. Uh, thanks for coming David. It was a pleasure. For sure. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for having me. Uh, hopefully I, I, I did the, uh, did, did the, the questions justice and if anyone has questions I, I i'm always happy to chat sounds good awesome cheers thanks girl thanks for listening if you want to see more episodes and support this podcast the best thing you can do is leave a review on itunes and share with your friends and colleagues if you have specific questions you would want me to answer you can submit them on the ux career website go to uxcareer.co slash questions. Goodbye, friends.